Uh, we're continuing on our studies in the Gospel of John, and we've been talking about encounters with God. And as we have been looking at these encounters, uh, we see that John the Baptist had an encounter with Jesus. Uh, Andrew, Peter, Philip, Nathaniel had encounters with Jesus. And when they were encountering Jesus, that they were actually encountering God. Now we're going to look at today a whole group of people that had an encounter with God. And that is in John chapter 2 where Jesus performs his first miracle. Let's look at John chapter 2 and begin reading in verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they had lacked wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus said unto them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, draw some water out now and bear it to the governor of the feast. And they bore it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not where it was, but the servants who drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called to the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then thou that which is worse, uh, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. As we come this morning, uh, I want to speak to you on this subject. Uh, would you like a refill? Would you like a refill? Uh, Father, we come to you today, and Lord, we uh, thank you for this uh, quaint little story in the Gospel of John. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to bring some powerful truths out of these verses that will help us today in our lives. And so, Lord, as we get into your word today, we invite the congregation to come and dine, the master's calling, come and dine. You can feast at Jesus' table anytime. He who fed the multitudes and turned the water into wine, come and dine, the master's calling, come and dine. Feed us, Lord, at your table, for it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Uh, as we come, let's do a quick review. Uh, we see that the purpose of the book of John, uh, and we hopefully you, uh, have this uh, down pat by this point, uh, but the purpose is specifically stated in John chapter 20, verses 31, uh, verses 30 through 31, and many other signs that Jesus did in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe. The purpose, the purpose of John writing, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that you might, uh, that believing you might have through his uh, life, through his name. So this is the purpose of the Gospel of John. As we look at, if you go to that next slide, uh, we said that uh, John's emphasis, the Gospel writers each had a different emphasis on the way that they presented Christ, and John's emphasis throughout the whole 21 chapters is to present Christ as God, is to pre present Jesus as God. And that's where we get the title of our series, uh, Close Encounters with God. And then in the introduction, finally, if you go to the next slide, uh, we see, uh, and, I, and I said, well, you know what, I, I'm, I'm going to get this uh, uh, out of the way up front, right, about whether or not this was uh, uh, non-alcoholic or alcoholic, uh, wine that uh, Jesus uh, changed the water uh, into. So we want to get this, like I said, out of the way 
because we know that inquiring minds want to know. Uh, now, I, I do want to say this, that I have written a uh, brochure, and it's entitled The Bible on Alcohol, and it's in the bookstore, so if you want to pick up a copy uh, in the bookstore, you can do so after church today. It's no, no charge for it. So if you want a copy of this, and, and I go into more detail in here uh, this morning, uh, I can't get into the detail because I, I taught a whole lesson on this right here. Uh, so uh, you can pick that up to get more information. Uh, but just real quick, uh, we see that uh, there's arguments on both sides, uh, whether it was uh, alcoholic, non-alcoholic, fermented, not fermented. So there, there's arguments on both sides. Uh, those of you who are looking for support, uh, you would like this first uh, set of arguments that uh, we are going to uh, talk about. And, and that is, uh, when you look at that word wine in John chapter 2, uh, it's the Greek word oinos. And uh, this is the same word that's used in Ephesians 5.18. And Ephesians 5.18 says this, and be not drunk. Uh, with wine. So we know that you can't get drunk off of oinos, right? You can't get drunk off of grape juice. If it's grape juice, you can't get drunk off of that. So people argue and say that this must be wine that Jesus turned the water into because it's the same word there in Ephesians 5.18. And actually, the, the wine that is spoken of in Ephesians 5.18, you can get drunk off of. So uh, this must have been uh, alcoholic or uh, fermented wine. And then the next argument goes like this. Uh, wine, like food, is not inherently sinful. So it, basically talking about fermented wine, uh, is not inherently sinful. It is the abuse of wine, which is what? Drunkenness. And because you can abuse food too, that when you look at uh, food and, and wine that, you know, the two uh, are inherently uh, not sinful. But when you abuse either one, then they become sinful. So uh, the argument is that Jesus could have turned the water into fermented wine. And then when you look at other places uh, in the scriptures, uh, we see, now again, I'm just presenting the argument, so I'm not uh, up here promoting one thing or another. Uh, you know, I'm just trying to be uh, fair in the presentation. Uh, when you look at other scriptures, uh, and you can read these scriptures for your uh, own uh, knowledge, that is, uh, and they put drinking alcohol in a positive light. You know, some of the uh, scriptures talk about wine which makes the heart glad. And, you know, you can't, your heart can't be glad if it's Welch's grape juice. All right. Uh, so, so, you know, the, 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 again, I, I go into a lot more detail uh, in here. Uh, so that's the argument for it being alcoholic. The arguments against is people say, well, Jesus would not do something that would go against the Bible. And, you know, the Bible is very clear that drunkenness uh, is a sin. And so Jesus wouldn't turn uh, water into something that would cause people to sin. And, and that's been the argument of a lot of ultra conservatives, you know, for a long time. You know, they, they, you know, that's the big argument that they have is that Jesus would not turn uh, uh, water into something that would actually be able to lead to people getting drunk. And, uh, and so Jesus, uh, again, that second point, would not have created something that would cause people to get drunk. And then uh, in Habakkuk 2.15, uh, the Bible forbids people uh, from drinking strong drink. So alcohol would be strong drink. So these are uh, arguments for and arguments against. So the bottom line is this. Uh, some people say it was unfermented, which would mean it was grape juice, uh, non-alcoholic. Other people say, well, it was fermented, which was alcoholic. And the bottom line is uh, we don't know. We don't know. So, you know, sorry that I didn't answer uh, the support that you came looking for this morning. Uh, no matter which side of the coin that you were looking for it on, that uh, I don't know. You know, so you know, we might have to be like the guy who was driving down the street 
and uh, he was uh, crossing over the, the middle line, and, and there was a policeman that saw him. And so the policeman put on his lights and, and started to chase him, and finally uh, ran him down and pulled him over and said, sir, have you been drinking? He said, you know, you were weaving you know, across the line back and forth. And he said, have you been drinking? And the guy said, uh, no. He said, well, let me smell your breath. And he breathed on. He said, man, your breath smells like you've been drinking. Sir, have you been drinking? He said, no, I haven't. He said, well, what do you got in that container right there? He said, that's water. And so the guy, the uh, officer said, well, let me see it. The officer picked it up and smelled it. He said, sir, this is wine. And the guy said, praise the Lord, he did it again. <laughs> so Jesus is a miracle worker, right? Even when you're driving down the road being chased by a police officer. All right. Uh, so how, how do you know when you need your cup? field. You know, when, when, when your cup is empty. And, and, and when we look at this uh, wedding, we see that they had ran out of wine. They were empty. And they needed somebody to come and replenish the wine. And sometimes in our life, we, we run out. I mean, we run out of patience. We run out of energy. We run out of zeal. You know, we just run out. So how do you know when you need your cup filled? Well, somebody put it like this. When one year in solitary confinement is sounding more and more like a good option, then that, that means that your cup has probably run out. Uh, when you have contacted the witness protection program to hide you from the people who are looking for you to do a favor for them, uh, you know, then probably your cup has uh, run low, all right? Uh, when you think you would like to work at KFC, because it might be nice to see something more fried than you feel. Uh, that it, it, it may be time, you know, to, to have your cup refilled. Uh, and when you find yourself seeing the long wait in the post line as a blessing from God, then uh, you, you may be running low. Your cup may be running low. Now, when you run out, uh, you know, there are certain responses that you can have whenever you, and I, I don't want to say specifically to running out of gas. You know, like when you run out of gas, you know, there's a couple things that you can do. Uh, you know, some people just keep trying to run on empty, right? And uh, you know what's going to happen when you run on empty. You know, have you ever been uh, in a car and your needle went all the way down and it looked like it was below E? And then they said that, man, you riding on the fumes. And, and, and so sometimes we can ride on fumes, but we know that riding on fumes is very nerve wracking. Riding on fumes means that you're taking the chance because it's going to lead to the next thing, which you can be stranded on the side of the road and that there are a lot of people who are stranded uh, spiritually on the side of the road. Uh, they've given up on their faith. Uh, they've given up on ministry. They've given up on, on, on trusting uh, God. You know, they just run out of resources, and here they are on the side of the road needing their tank filled up. And so we realize that the third response is the wise response, is that you take time to get a refill that when your energy is low, that when you've worn out, it's time to take time to get a refill. So let's look at our message today as we get into the, the message today. So that, first of all, we want to look at the need for a refill, the need for a refill. And we see that in the first couple verses in the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 2, the need for a refill. Verse 1, and the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And so we see here that the third day is the third day from when? Well, if you go back to the previous chapter, he had been talking to Nathaniel. Remember he had that conversation, I saw you under the fig tree, and when I saw you under the fig tree, uh, I knew that exactly what you were reading and uh, people say, well, it was a third day from then. But uh, we need to keep in mind that the Jewish marriage feast actually lasted seven days. So it's the possibility that the third day was the third day of the wedding feast. 
that Jesus actually and his disciples show up on the third day of the wedding feast. Now notice here that the mother of Jesus was there and, and she's going to play a significant role uh, in this story. In verse 2, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. So uh, they had uh, a personal invitation. Now keep in mind at this time, Jesus probably only had about three or four disciples. You know, he probably had the ones that he got in John chapter 1 and the other disciples hadn't been called as of yet. So it wasn't like he was bringing 12 guys to crash this uh, wedding. So he probably just came with uh, three or four of his disciples. And then we see in verse 3, and when they lacked wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. And so Mary comes to Jesus. Now keep in mind, this is the first miracle that Jesus performed. So there's no reason outwardly why Mary would have came to Jesus. There's a lot of speculation as to why she came. But, you know, I was thinking maybe she thought about the fact that, you know, I got pregnant without a human male being involved. And there's something special about this child. Maybe Mary remembered him growing up. Now, I believe, and, you know, some people might argue with this, is that Jesus never sinned. That when he grew up, I, I don't think that Jesus ever threw a temper tantrum. When, when he grew up, I don't think Jesus ever hit his little brothers and sisters. And we do know that he had brothers and sisters that, you know, he, Mary just didn't have Jesus and didn't have any more children. Because the Bible says in other places that he had brothers and sisters. So Jesus grew up with brothers and sisters. So I don't believe that he hit his brothers and sisters. I don't, so Jesus grew up as kind of like a perfect child. As a matter of fact, the only thing... That, and, and I'm going to show you this here in a second. The only thing that uh, we negative that said about Jesus is that one day when they went to Jerusalem and they were celebrating one of the Passovers and they were halfway back home that they couldn't find him. And they wondered where he was at. And his mother kind of got on him. You know, well, man, son, don't you know that you had us worried? You know, we, we were concerned as to where you at, where we're at. But other than that, you know, I believe that Jesus had a perfect bragging record. And so Mary must have knew that there was something special about Jesus. And I'm not sure what Mary's role was in the wedding. Maybe, you know, these people were good friends. The fact that Jesus and his disciples got an invitation may mean that they had a connection with the family. And so there's a need that's there. And so Mary comes to Jesus with the need. And, you know, when I think about, you know, there was a need for a refill. And, and, and we think about our lives. And sometimes we have a need for a refill. We have performance without power. We, 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 we kind of go through the motion, right? We, we, we're doing God's work. We're doing God's business. We're doing business for God. But God's nowhere around. You know, we, we haven't invited him into our lives. We, we haven't spent time in his presence. We haven't called upon him to give us strength that we have performance without power. It's almost like the man in 1 Kings or 2 Kings chapter 6 that was chopping down the trees. And as he was chopping down the trees, his axe head flew off into the water. And, and, and in, in my mind, I kind of see him after his axe head flies off that he hits the tree a couple more times with the axe handle. As he hit the tree with the axe handle, nothing happened. Why? Because his power was gone. The axe head was gone. And I wonder sometimes if that's not our case, that we are getting out here, we're doing ministry, we are serving God, and we have performance without power. That, that, you know, there was a time when we served God and, and we knew that the power of God rested upon us to do whatever he called us to do, that we, we, we had the, the power to be able to accomplish 
great things for God. We had the power to be able to uh, do ministry for God. But now we have performance without power. And this can happen to anybody. It can happen to ushers. It can happen to Christian teachers. It can happen to people in the choir. You know, I, I remember when I was uh, pastoring in Virginia and, uh, you know, we had a uh, minister and I remember back uh, after the service that we went back into the uh, uh, gathering room to kind of, you know, get our, uh, take our robes off and stuff. And, and, and the one choir director said, we sure did make those Negroes shout. I thought to myself, well, was that what it was all about? You know, was, was that what it was all about? Just, just trying to make people shout? Or, or were you trying to cut down trees? Were, were you trying to touch the hearts of people? I thank God that, that this morning, that our hearts were touched by the songs that were sung, especially Be Thou Faithful Under Death. Man, as I listened to that song, it reached into my spirit. And I didn't necessarily want to shout, but it just made me start to think, man, when I stand before the Lord, that's what I want to hear. Well done. And, and that's when you know the power of God is upon what you do, when people's lives and people's hearts have been touched. And so some of us need a refill because we need the power of God. We have ministry without moisture. You know, David said in uh, Psalm 32, he said that my moisture is turned into the drought of summer. That, that, that we, we are serving and, and, and there's a dryness in our spirit. You know, that, that, you know the, the, the idea of moisture, the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be upon what you do. Oh, l l let me tell you something. When the anointing of the Holy Spirit is upon you, then people can criticize you. People can talk about you. People can degrade you, and it doesn't get to your spirit. Why? Because you've been anointed. You've got that anointing upon you. When, when, when it comes time, when, when it seems like you know, you're, you're doing things and, and you're making no progress at all, it's very easy to lose the anointing. And when you lose that anointing, then, then you're short. When you lose that anointing, then you get frustrated. When you lose that anointing, then you, you, you get uh, just a, a negative mindset. And so we have ministry without moisture. David, again, he said that my moisture is turned to the drought of summer. What is moisture? Moisture is that vitality. Moisture is that excitement. Moisture is that, that, that fire that, that comes upon you because you want to do what God has called you to do. We have evangelism without enthusiasm. Evangelism without enthusiasm. And, and that is that we have lost our joy in service. You know, we're not excited about what it is that, that we're supposed to do. You know, I, I, you know, I, I look at performance without power. I look at uh, ministry without moisture. Evangelism without enthusiasm. You know, I was thinking, you know, there's sometimes that I go to the gym and I know I just don't have it, right? I mean, either, there might be something on my mind or the energy level isn't there. And, uh, you know, I drive, there's been a couple of times, man, I, just, I drove up to the parking lot and parked my car in the parking lot and got ready to get out of the car. He said, man, no, it ain't happening today. <laughs> you know, I just don't have it. And then there's been other times I've actually gone into the gym. I've got on the machine and started, because I like that elliptical machine, started on the machine, said, no, nah, it's not there. And then I looked out the window, and the Chick-fil-A is right across the... <laughs> So I, I got off the machine and was going, I said, somebody said, Glaze, man, didn't I see you just come in? Yeah, man, I said, I, I just don't have it today. You know, it's, it's just not there. And, and, and so, you know, what, 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 I, there's something that's missing 
You know, there's other days you can go in and you feel like, man, you could take on the world. And, and so, you know, when we can come to these times in our life, you know, maybe you're dealing with family situations where it's just worn you out. You don't have the, the moisture to, to be able to deal with it anymore. You don't have the anointing to be able to deal with it. You know, you need to do like the, the slaves said, that song they sang, steal away to Jesus. You, you, you need to steal away. So, so some of us, there is a need for uh, a refill. I, I think I have a slide. I, I might have went over it, but if you'll go back where it, it talked about uh, when things are right. I don't know if you can, when things are right, it talked about peace and joy. Uh, and there you go. Look, look. See, when, when, when the containers are full, that, that you know, when, when, when these, and, and, and again, oh, see, let, 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 let me say this. That, and I'm jumping ahead of myself, but, you know, uh, you can answer these questions, you know, and that is asking you in the notes. And, and it, it said that they had these water pots, right, which were purifying, right? So th th these water pots that they had were not for wine. You know, they, they were water, they were filled with water that was used for cooking, that was used for washing your hands, cleaning up. They, they were used for purifying purposes. And so they had these little, uh, little wine pouches or goblets that they would have. And so, you know, it's a big difference between that wine pouch or goblet and this big uh, container of water. Okay, so there, there it goes right there. Uh, on, on the left is the big water pots uh, that they used. And these water pots, according to the scripture, uh, they, uh, a firkin, it talked about a firkin, and a firkin was actually nine gallons. And it said that each one of those water pots, and, and on the left are some water pots that they found that they actually used back in the first century. So when Jesus talks about them filling the water pots, uh, these would have been the type of water pots they talked about. So uh, a firkin was nine gallons. And it said that each one contained, uh, uh, could, could contain uh, two to three firkins, which would have been you know, anywhere between 18 and 27 gallons. And there was, there was six of them. So on the right would be, if you go back, uh, on the right would be like the little wine pouch that they had at the wedding. So that would have been the one that was filled. Now again, you, you might not be able to tell by these pictures up here, but uh, it was a lot smaller and probably only it probably contained about a gallon or so. So I'm not sure how many of these that they had, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that whatever they had, they ran out. They ran out. So if you go back to that other slide. Now, when that container that was on the right, when there was a sufficient amount of wine, let's notice what happened. First of all, there's joy. People say, well, where did you get that from? Look at, look at verse 1. There's joy. Uh, and the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. So two times in those two verses, it uses the word marriage. This was a celebration. You know, again, these wedding marriages or feasts lasted for a week. So it was a time of joy. It was a time of celebration. So when we have sufficient enough resources in our life, guess what we have? We got joy. That when we are walking with God, can you imagine that the joy that when people started finding out that they were running, oh man, look, I'm going home, man. I got some stuff stored at home, and I'll go home and drink. You know, there, there, were, there would have been, when they found out that there was no more wine, there would have been a loss of joy, that the joy that they had wouldn't have been there. And, and, and when we are not filled with the Spirit of God, there's, there's a, a, a lacking of joy in our life. That's why, you know, some people, you know, going through problems, and, and they walking around, as I heard somebody say, 
like bulldogs baptized in lemon juice. You know, you, you, you don't have any joy. And, and, and the joy, the lack of joy, shows up on your face. So as long as there was sufficient enough supplies, there was joy. But even, notice this, that there's peace when you have sufficient enough supplies. Verse 3, and when they lacked wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. Now, she should have been doing what? She should have been enjoying the feast. But now what has her... Her peace was gone. Her peace was gone. Like, like she knew there's something wrong here. And when we are not filled with the spirit of the living God, it, it, our, our, we're robbed of our peace. You know, I, I, I heard uh, in the Calvary Road, Roy Hessian, he talks about uh, how to tell when peace is gone. And he talks about, you know, the verse that, that, that says uh, that, that we have peace with God. And, and he gave the illustration. He said, think about uh, a basketball game. And that as they're playing basketball and running up and down the court, the players are allowed to play. They just keep playing. They just keep running up and down the court. Because what? There's nothing wrong. Nobody's committed a foul. Nobody has uh, done anything that, that's worthy of stopping the game. But the minute that somebody commits a foul, what does the referee do? The referee blows a whistle and the whole game is stopped. And he says that the peace of the game has, has been disturbed. The peace of the game has been disturbed where they were normally running up and down the court, everything is all right, but now they blow the whistle and the peace has been taken from the game. And he likens that to the Christian. And he says that as long as you know, we are walking in the spirit, you know, serving the Lord, you know, exercising the things that God wants us to do, that, that God just, he, he allows us to move freely. Why? Because we're doing things that he wants us to do. And, and we have peace that everything is all right. That when I'm walking along, I have a peace that everything between me and God is all right. I have a peace with myself. But the minute that something goes wrong, the, the great referee, the Holy Spirit, blows the whistle. And now you don't have that same feeling. You, you, you know the feeling that you had? Like, Everything was cool, right? Everything was all right. And now the, the whistle, the Holy Spirit blows a whistle, and the Holy Spirit says, wait, stop, a foul has been committed. And that the peace is taken away. And the same thing at this wedding, that there was peace at this wedding until they ran short on the wine. Then it's almost like, well, we know, because uh, we weren't at the wedding, so we don't know about all of it, but we know that there was some of the wedding that was stopped because they ran out. The joy was gone, the peace was gone, and that there was no satisfaction. You know, again, that, you know, people were probably complaining. You know how it is. You know, y'all you know, know, know how it is when you go somewhere and the food is not right or, the, you know, it's, they run out of something, you know, the, 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 the host comes up, oh, man, this is a great event. But you go back to your table, right, man? I can't believe that. <laughs> Y'all know I'm telling the truth. So the satisfaction level was gone. But but when they when they drank Jesus wine, the man said, "Look, you saved the best for last. You know, everybody is satisfied with what you gave us. And so when the containers are full, right? There's what? There's joy. There's peace." There's satisfaction. When, when your container is full in your life because you've been in the presence of God, because you spent time with God, that when your container is full in your life, there's joy, peace, and satisfaction. So I'm here to say this morning, if you don't have joy, 
If you don't have peace, if you don't have satisfaction, is it because maybe your container is low and you need a refill? Maybe you need a refill today. It's just like sitting at that table, right, at the restaurant, and you drink all your, your beverage, and the waiter comes by and says, would you like a refill? If your joy is low today, Jesus is coming by and saying, would you like a refill? If your peace is low today, Jesus is coming by and says, would you like a refill? If your satisfaction is low today, Jesus is coming by and says, would you like a refill? The need for a refill. Then we see the way to get a refill. The way to get a refill. Verse 4, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. So we think that that's cold on the part of Jesus, right? This is his mom. You know, you know we, we had a word back in the day. Some of y'all know what I'm getting ready to say. I'm dating myself. Some of y'all uh, know what I'm getting ready to say is that uh, my, my raise, right? <laughs> This, this, was, this was his raise. You know, it's, 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 I mean, they do the same thing today, but it's amazing how you can take words and, and make a whole philosophy out of it, right? right? My raise. This is the, the woman that raised me. And, and, and this, this was Jesus' raise. And he called her woman. So the first thing that we need to uh, correct is that this was not a term of disrespect. But notice now, see, and, and this is the important part, that Jesus had just began his public ministry. And the relationship between him and his mother was getting ready to shift. Right? That it was, it was shifting from one who submitted to his mother. It was shifting to now... I'm going to be your Lord. And, and, and so the term woman was not a term of disrespect, but it was a term that would have been used of any uh, lady at that day that you wanted to show respect to. Woman. Because Jesus uses it again. Remember in John 19, I think it was, where uh, he tells uh, John and John and Mary's there, and he says, woman, behold thy son. So it wasn't a term of disrespect. It was a term of respect for a lady, woman, the Greek word that's used, woman. And so, again, he's talking about a shift in relationship. And, and, and then to even further uh, show this shift in the relationship, he says unto her, he says, woman, in verse 4, what have I to do with thee? And, and actually, uh, in the Greek, it says, what does it have to do with us? You know, so you know, the King James, you might think that he was just saying, well, what does that have to do with me? He said, what does it got to do with us? And, and, and that my hour is not yet come. Jesus says, this is not the hour that I, have, I was sent for. The hour that I was sent for is when I would die on the cross and that I would be buried and rose again. That's my hour. Remember he said later on, he said, uh, the hour is come, right? When he talked about when he would die on the cross and rise again. And so he tells her that my hour is not yet come. Now, I'm not sure whether there was some nonverbal communication between Mary and Jesus, or if they just had, you know, you, you know how you, you say, you know, like this, you know, we're just on one page. But, I mean, you could read this and say, well, Mary just kind of just, just disrespected and kicked to the curb what he said. Because she goes on in the next verse and says, his mother saith unto the servants, whatever he saith unto you, do it. Whatever he says, do it. So, I mean, where did she get that from? I mean, again, you don't, you don't get that in the text. You know, you get Jesus telling her, woman, what, the heck, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And then the mother said, well, whatever he says, do it. So I don't know, you know, again, like this. This is in my sanctified imagination, you know, that Jesus said, well, you know, my hour is not yet come. 
But somehow he communicated to Mary, you know, I got you. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Something happened. Something happened where she told the servants, whatever he says unto you, to do it. And then in verse 6, and there were set there six water pots of stone. So again, we've already talked about that. The water pots were uh, used for purifying. So that was the you wash your hands, wash the utensils, clean, uh, whatever it is that they were fixing to eat. And it says that uh, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. So again, a firkin was nine gallons. All right, so two or three firkins would have been uh, 18 to 27 gallons. And there were six of these water pots. And Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them to the brim. So it doesn't say if there was anything in there, if there was already water in there, but they filled them to the brim. And then in verse 8, and saith, he saith unto them, draw some out now and bear it to the governor of the feast. So the governor of the feast, you know, he would have been the individual that was kind of, you know, like I've done a lot of weddings and they have uh, wedding coordinators, right? And so this governor would have been like the coordinator of the banquet, all right? And so he says, draw it out now, bear it unto the governor of the feast, and they bore it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not from where it was, but the servants who drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when, these, when men have well drunk, that which, which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. And so Jesus turns this water into wine. What a powerful miracle. The fact that they put water. Can't you imagine? So what's the title of our series? Encounters with God. Encounters with God. These servants, put, they knew they put water in these barrels. And when they dipped it out, it was wine. Are you in need of a miracle today? I mean, really, really, are you in need of a miracle today? I, I wish I had time to tell you all the miracles that God has worked in my life, in my family's life. I, I wish I had time today to tell you the miracles that I have seen here at Bethany Baptist Church. There's a couple miracles that we're trusting God for. But when you look at the man who can turn the water into wine, you don't have anything to be concerned about. You know, you just, you don't, there's no reason to stress. If you believe that Jesus is who he said he is, there's no reason for you to stress. Lord, you got this. If, if, if you can take water. Now, you know, some of the skeptics might say, well, there was already some, uh, uh, concentrated wine at the bottom and then when they pour the water in, you know. No, no, no. Jesus turned this water into wine. And so how do we get a refill? I, I, if your cup is empty, how do you get a refill? First of all, you got to acknowledge the fact, Lord, I'm empty. Lord, I'm dry. Lord, I have, I, in my spirit, I have nothing left to give. That as I sit here today, my spirit is empty and I don't have anything to give. You've got to acknowledge that your cup is empty. And then you've got to let the divine waiter know. You say, you know, you've got to let the waiter know. The waiter comes by, but you've got to let the, yes, I would like a refill. Please give me a refill. Put re, a refill in my cup. You've got to let them know. And so we, we, we sing the song. You got Jesus on the main line. Call him up and tell him what you want. And you know the thing, you know, we get impatient and it might not happen in our time. And sometimes if we don't see things happening in, according to our time table, we get frustrated. You got to let God work this thing out. You just let the divine waiter know 
that your cup is empty. And then take your cup and hold it up to the Lord. And say, Lord, fill my cup. Lord, fill my cup. And then let me just close real quick with this. And that is the taste of the refill. What is the taste of the refill? First of all, it's better than the first. <laughs> it's better than the first. You know? Man, I, I, man, you know, my life before Christ, I was drinking from all kind of the wrong cups. And I thought that these cups taste good. And, and I was like, like these folks here, you know, at this wedding. They were drinking wine and they thought that it was that was the best. Right? Right? They thought it was the best. But when Jesus turned the water into wine, they found out, man, what we were drinking before was nothing. What we drank before was nothing. But now we have the best. And then I like what the psalmist said. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Lord, fill it up. Father, we come to you today and we thank you for the story of the wedding where they ran out of wine and how that Jesus was able to fill the water pots with water and turn them into wine and Lord I don't know where your people are today Lord, maybe there's some that's, that's sitting here and their, their cup is bone dry. Or, or maybe there's just a little left in the bottom. Lord, you know. And Lord, we come, Lord, realizing that we can't do a thing without you. That we can't do anything on an empty cup. And so, Lord, we ask that you would fill us with your spirit today, that you would fill us, that you would empower us to be able to do the things that you want for us to do. Whether it's deal with people on our job, whether it's deal with people at the church, whether it's deal with family, whatever the case might be, Lord, our cups are empty today. We need you to fill us up so that we can do, deal with life, so that we can do life. Oh God, maybe, maybe there's somebody here today They've been dealing with an illness. And that illness has just drained your cup. It has, it has drained your cup down to the bottom. And you are here today. And you, you need Jesus just to come by and take that heavenly pitcher and pour the Holy Spirit with all its fullness into your cup. Lord, I pray that they would hold their cup up today. Lord, maybe there's some relationships here that have exhausted all the moisture that has dried up the cup. And Lord, they need you to come by and just pour the beverage of the Holy Spirit into their cup. Fill them up this morning, Lord. Lord, maybe there's someone here today that, that they've dealt with a financial situation. Lord, they're dealing with a financial problem that has just drained their cup. And they need to be filled today. Lord, maybe there's someone here today dealing with an addiction issue. And they've drained, they've exhausted everything that's in their cup. And Lord, they need you. They need you today to fill up their cup. Oh, God, I pray that you would move in this congregation today. Lord, there are people here that might think that this message is for somebody else. That's for that person sitting next to me, or that's for the person sitting in the back row or in the front row. But, Lord, you are saying that the message, no. Not my father. Not my brother. But it's me. Oh, Lord. Stand in the need of prayer. Lord, touch us in our dryness. Touch us in our powerlessness. Touch us in our joylessness. Touch us, Lord. Fill our cup. 
so that we would leave this place ready to do your bidding. We commit this congregation to you. We commit this invitation to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us stand.